Development Program for Graduate Studies at Charles Darwin University. Hello, I'm Tara Ravazon, and I'm the Dean of Graduate Studies at Charles Darwin University, and welcome to this Touchstone beginning session on academic integrity. In the old days, say five years ago, we focused a lot on plagiarism and collusion as part of the suite of academic misconduct policies. So even if the phrase academic integrity was used, it really was talking about a plagiarism policy. So before we go through why there has been a cultural shift and change in our universities, let's put in place some definitions. Academic integrity is a positive phrase and a positive suite of policies that enable information literacy, citation practices and referencing. The legendary Tracy Breitag and her remarkable handbook of academic integrity described it as, quote, critical to every aspect of the educational process, end of quote. Academic integrity is integral to all students and obviously particularly matters in postgraduate education and higher degrees. And it matters for many reasons, but we can't have academic freedom without academic integrity. Academic freedom is founded on and by a community of scholars who share rights and responsibilities. Curtin University, for example, has made academic integrity part of its core values. So they argue that integrity is founded on honesty, trust, fairness, respect, courage, excellence and impact. Historically, academic integrity emerged through the end of the 19th century when university academics were not only required to teach but publish original research as well. And there is a very interesting and complicated relationship between academic integrity and research integrity, academic misconduct and research misconduct. The ARC focuses on research integrity and misconduct with the goal of safeguarding the confidence in publicly funded research, valuing peer review, grant selection processes and evaluation processes, the maintenance of research standards. An integrity breach research or academic is a deviation from agreed principles, either at the ARC or university level. So academic misconduct and research misconduct refer to fabrication, plagiarism, fraud, deception and falsification. This also refers to a mismanagement of conflict of interest, including the selection of higher degree examiners and a failure to either gain or abide by ethics clearances. At Columbia University, and I like this a lot, can I say, academic integrity and the responsible conduct of research is aligned into a single policy, focusing particularly on proper citation and really monitoring paraphrasing. Now, all of these are really deal-breaker issues for research higher degrees, and we do need clear regulatory strategies to mitigate and manage any breaches Most universities in Australia, including Charles Darwin University, have separate policies for academic integrity and research integrity. For research higher degree students and supervisors, this manifests in two ways, I think. There was a focus on plagiarism through the candidature, but also a focus on plagiarism discovered through the examination process. And they're really two very different entities, I think. But there are some challenges for us to consider. For example, when we're thinking about plagiarism and research misconduct, what is the status of a draft sent to a supervisor by a student? So any moment a draft is exchanged between a supervisor and a student could engage academic misconduct proceedings. So this is quite troubling as the status of a student draft during their candidature is not clear. Is it submitted 
and accessible work. So universities around the world have got themselves into a fair amount of trouble when, say, a supervisor didn't like a particular student, cried plagiarism on a minor draft, and that was a way to remove the student from their supervision. So as you can see, this all gets a bit messy. The best way, I think, to think about this is, I think, we know what is accessible work for an undergraduate. So they submit an essay, we've got exams and so forth. But what is the status of that rough draft attached to a weekly email sent between a PhD supervisor and student? I think we need some clarity about the status of that draft when we're thinking about academic integrity. And can I say, I've got some reasonably personal knowledge of this because it happened to me as a head of school in one of my former universities. A supervisor wanted to get rid of a student and so they pinged plagiarism. And I, as the head of school, had to investigate the case using undergraduate regulations. Really dreadful. The best strategy is to tether academic integrity assessment, I think, to our student milestones and annual reviews. That is, we assess the written work submitted. So we look at a research proposal and we assess it for quality and rigour, but also academic integrity. I recommend to our students that they use Turnitin in draft form through their candidature and they use it for an educational purpose, a diagnostic purpose, rather than as punishment. In this way, students can learn, can learn about plagiarism, learn about academic integrity in a diagnostic rather than a punitive way. So for supervisors, that weekly exchange of drafts is andragogy. It is a diagnostic that our students hold a high level of information literacy. It's also a diagnostic if we see that our student requires some intervention from either the Office of Research Integrity or our great colleagues in the library. And of course, I'm available to care for and offer any support to you as required. But we really need to explore the full suite of academic integrity and research integrity policies and procedures. And we need to therefore look at that second issue. How does academic integrity and research integrity operate during the examination of theses? There is no doubt that plagiarism located by international examiners in a PhD or research master's is the most institutionally damaging academic misconduct breach that we can confront at a university. But if we engage in academic integrity right from the start of a candidature, and I hope that this touchstone session triggers discussions between students, between supervisors, between us all, then we can all talk with honesty and clarity and care and compassion about how we create best international practice. And that is best international practice in information literacy for our research higher degree candidates. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for listening to Touchstones, our professional development program for graduate studies at Charles Darwin University. Thank you.